<laughs> Welcome to episode number 306 of the Beyond Social Media Show, the podcast for all of you uh, marketing, advertising, public relations, and communications professionals. You can find us uh, by searching for Beyond Social Media Show. We are recording live on YouTube on May 3, 2020. A lot of things to talk about this week, as we usually do, including Press Freedom Day, the virtual draft, Stay the F Home Festival, What's up? <laughs> Verification Handbook, Defining Home, Billboards for Doctors, Signing Off, Meet Google Meet, The Great Unfluencing, Unfiltered Zoom, Misery Loves Company, Frankenstein Live, Voice Explosion, Defining SMB, Burn In, and a lot, lot more. And BL kicks it off with Best Story of the Week. As usual, BL, what do you got? Well, today is World Press Freedom Day, and so what I have is a summary of how uh, various world leaders are um, tweeting about that. And um, Mohammed Lila, Lila tweeted Justin Trudeau's comment right next to Trump's. Trudeau said, "Today in and day in and day out, journalists work tirelessly, often on the front lines, asking the tough questions to keep us informed and uphold democracy." On World Press Freedom Day, we say thank you and recommit to defending press freedom in Canada and around the world. And what Trump said was the, <laughs> the fake news doesn't show real polls. Lamestream media is totally corrupt, in all caps, the enemy of the people. Kamala Harris tweeted, Trump cuts down and attacks the press at every turn because he doesn't like the truth. On World Press Freedom Day, we must never lose sight that a free press is the bedrock of our democracy. It's more important than ever. And um, Christine Amanpour said, uh, let's defend and give thanks for this essential service, speaking truth to power and holding it accountable, sacrificing even life to find the facts as vital today as it's ever been. And earlier in the week, I, I tweeted um, a contrast between how Governor Cuomo ends his daily press conference. Um, and he said, you're doing a great job. God bless you. Thank you. Which is how real world leaders talk. <laughs> and I said, you rock, Governor. Now cancel the rent for May. Um, not Coincidentally, today is also National Trump Twitter Blackout Day and Go Joe Day, where thousands of people are uh, tweeting about uh, why they like Joe Biden. <laughs> well, go free press. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, <laughs> all for that. <laughs> um, so one, uh, the the uh, my big one was not surprisingly about football. Um, because <laughs> I have a, football. Yeah, exactly. I have an opportunity to talk about it. It's last week the NFL <laughs> held its uh, held its um, NFL draft annual dra annual amateur draft, and uh, a lot of people were like, "How are they going to do this?" Because they had to do it all virtually. Um, they did it all with with video teleconferencing. Uh, you put in the general manager and the head coach and all of their scouting uh, scouting team. And uh, across 32 teams in the league, and then all of these amateur drafts, they had video cameras in the uh, in the um, players who were being drafted in their homes, so you could see their reactions. They had video cameras in the homes of the GMs and the head, head coaches, so you could see them deliberating. Uh, the uh, league commissioner announced the draft, announced the draft choices and the draft picks and everything, and it actually went off flawlessly. It was pretty amazing. Um, it was almost, I was almost inviting something to go wrong, but nothing did. Um, so as a result, um, not just that, but everybody starved for sports news. Uh, the NFL had 55 million viewers across Nielsen's, uh, uh measured channels over the three days of the broadcast. So the, um, the, the draft took uh, place on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, um, that was a 16 percent uh year over year uh increase um this is from a marketing dive article by peter adams so they broke the records in every day for new audience eyes thursday night was round one so that's the most important pick for every team uh they commanded 
15.6 million viewers, which was a 37% year over year left. Friday was rounds two for three, and they that was up 40%. Saturday was the, re the remaining rounds through four, four through seven, that was up 32%. Um, the average audience of over 8.4 million viewers watched all three days, that was me included, uh, on ABC, ESPN, the NFL Network, and ESPN Deportes. Uh, the digital plant, Channels, digital channels shattered the previous high of 6.2 million viewers last year uh, with gains of 35%. So uh, it was pretty amazing to behold. My Vikings did a fantastic job. We had a ton of picks, two first rounders. Uh, I just hope the season takes place. <laughs> Wait, so, so th this was all virtual? It was all virtual. It was all video teleconferencing. It was pretty amazing to watch. Wow, so they had like amazing. zooms of the commentators. There's Deion Sanders and uh, and uh, the host talking about the picks and everything. And they cut to the commissioner announcing the pick, and they cut to shots of the uh, shots of the uh, GM and the coach. And they'd have recordings of the call. So the guy who got picked gets a call from the head coach, and uh, is pretty. Well, it was more of an intimate view than you usually see. That's very cool. You know, they did the Kentucky Derby yesterday virtually with virtual horses. It was like um, uh, incredible because it looked so real. And and um, who won uh, the most famous horse of all time? Um, oh, God, I can't think of the name. But anyway, it looked like real horses on a real track. It was really phenomenal. And, you know, because yesterday was supposed to be the race. And now I guess it's supposed to happen in real life in September. But I do have a question for you. How was the lighting on the Zooms? Oh, uh, gosh, I can't remember. Um, I think it was probably it was probably what you'd expect, buried. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you <know>? um, <laughs> but hey, I've been saying the the uh, EA, EA Sports, which produces the Madden video game, NFL football video game, should be p doing virtual a virtual league. I mean, they should just play virtual games because people watch video games. Uh, oh, yeah, they do. And, and, you know, yeah. I know you can't live without your sports. So exactly. New York City had a festival called the New York City Stay the F Home Festival last night. And this was from uh, DoNYC.com. And it was a remote online show. It was open to artists from all over the world. It was 100% free to watch or apply to play. And uh, all they asked was that, they use Venmo to tip the musicians. I have to say, um, being as old as I am, it was a bunch of musicians I've never heard of <laughs> playing music I didn't really care for. But the idea, <laughs> it was a great idea. And it, it uh, goes back to Samuel Jackson's reading that you talked about last week. <laughs> That's great. Um, Speaking of stay at home, staying at home, Budweiser has remixed their, or not remixed, but remade, had a had a follow up, a sequel to their What's Up commercial. You remember the What's Up commercial? <laughs> yes, you know? How could I forget? Yeah. So um, <laughs> this is from today's Ronnie Koenig, who talks about the uh, the ad features. Um, Former NBA, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stumble on this because I'm not a basketball fan, so I don't really know any of these people. Former NBA stars Chris Bosch, Dwayne Wade, I know who he is, but I, uh, WNBA star Candace uh, Parker and DJ D Nice. Uh, so they all were in a Zoom like uh, call chat, and they're all going, "So what's up? What's up? What's up? What's up?" <laughs> yeah, staying at home, watching the re rewatching the games, having a bud <laughs> because everybody's watching rewatching old games. Uh, but it was very cleverly done, and then it closed with a message uh, that said, "Checking in. That's what's up." And then it had a number for the Salvation Army for people who need to talk to someone. So it was it was really well done and a, and a good way to keep uh, their well, talking about staying at home, um, I had a virtual visit with my eye doctor the other day. I said, I need computer glasses. And so he uh, sent me a prescription by email. I then went to Warby Parker. I picked out these frames and uh, gave them my prescription. And what do you know? They arrived yesterday, and now I can see. And I didn't have to leave my house to do any of this. Pretty amazing. They look great. Thanks. <laughs> That's great. Is that one of your stories? No, I, I just, you were talking about staying at home. So I just. 
<laughs> okay, so here's my story. Um, this um, new verification handbook for disinformation and media manipulation is now online available to everyone, and it is so important. It's from uh, Data Journalism, which is um, the European Journalism Center, and it it's it's done for journalists, but it's available to everybody. It has knowledge about how to investigate social media accounts, bots, private messaging apps, uh, information operations, deep fakes, and all kinds of disinformation and media manipulation. And it is supported by the Craig Newmark Philanthropies. And um, it lets some of the world's best experts teach you how to investigate your information environment online. I cannot think of a more important time for this to be happening. Very good, great resource. Everybody should avail themselves of it. Our audience, of course, already knows all this stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, not all of them. <laughs> yeah. um, this is uh, this is. There's an Apple TV Plus has a new sh show. It's a docu series called Home, and it is an exploration of the concept of the living space that we call home. Uh, each episode is a profile of an individual architect. Uh, they feature the home that the architect built and why they, so the architect discusses why they built it that way. And it's just incredible. There's there's a, a greenhouse home by uh, an architect who lives in, I think, Norway or someplace that's, that's cold well, often. And uh, he built his home, he built a greenhouse around his home, basically. Oh, so I it's love 70 that. degrees or nice temperate weather um, or a, a year round, they grow food in there. It has a filtration system, so they use rainwater and wastewater and refilter it. So the, it's it's just completely environmentally sustainable. Um, there's and another beautiful. and beautiful. There's another one of a of a bamboo house. So this this woman built a house entirely out of bamboo. And bamboo apparently it takes like five years to grow bamboo to the point that you can use it as building material. And so it's a much more sustainable source of building material. It's very strong, actually. So it's fascinating. It's an amazing house, too. All of these houses are amazing. There's oh. a, uh, a Chicago artist who turns abandoned buildings into kind of creative gathering spaces that, uh, that also happen to revitalize neighborhoods in, in, in downtown Chicago. Um, it, and it's, so, it's, so it's, it's that. It's a rumination on the idea of what, what home means. It's uh, profiles of the architects, and they're beautiful homes uh and it's also it's a celebration of creativity and ingenuity because it's just amazing some of the things they've done so can't recommend it highly higher and it's so much fun to look at other people's houses <laughs> that's always a much better thing. than yours yeah always so um this is just a really quick one um ads of the world um is the source and uh the, it's just a uh, a series of billboards that are in support of doctors. It's simple, it's powerful, it's outdoor billboards by McCann. It's just beautiful, huge images. It, it's, I'll put a link in the show notes. It's just a, a beautiful and wonderful tribute. Very cool. Um, I came across this article this uh, by Nicholas uh, Gurki. I don't know how to pronounce his German name. I can't pronounce it. It has an umlaut on it, so I'm having <laughs> difficulty <laughs> uh, uh, from the next web. And uh, it had some data in there that I'd already that I'd come across, but it had a, a, an interesting um, comment on it that uh, basically it's about email signature sign off. So what you say when you close on an email. Um, it, it, I'm going to quote from the article that says, Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman found evidence across several studies for something he dubbed the peak end rule. And what is that? Dave? At their most intense moments and right before they end. So when you sign off then it, it also cites this this uh, boomerang plugin a boomerang plugin for gmail analyzed uh, 350,000 email closings in 2017 and found um, that the likelihood of someone responding went up from 22 to 38% uh, for three phrases uh, compared to the baseline so those phrases are thanks in advance which uh, had a 65.7 absolute response rate. Thanks had a 63% response rate, and thank you had a 57.9% response rate. Um, 
Conversely, though, the ones that didn't perform uh, so well were Cheers, Kind Regards, Regards, Best Regards, and Best. Um, Those are so old. I, they are. I use Best and Best Regards a lot when I don't expect anything from people. I use Thanks <laughs> if they've done something for me, and I use Thanks uh, in advance when I expect them to do something for me, right? <laughs> I use thanks in advance ever since you told me about it. <laughs> <laughs> you got a better response, the, right? Yeah, on the show about a year ago, <laughs> you talked about that. And what a good idea. And I use that now. And, and, and I it found, does have a good response. Yeah, I, I was interested in the, in this particular article. It explained, it gave a, a psychological framing of, of why it works. So, um, that was interesting anyway. Well, that is interesting. So, um, you know, everybody's streaming their brains out right now. And uh, Google has made it possible for anybody with a Google account uh, to be able to use Google Meet, which used to be Google Hangouts, typical of Google. Uh, Google Meet video conferencing for free meetings that can last any amount of time and have up to 100 people. So this is from a Verge story by Dieter Bonn. And, um, it just um, renamed it and added it to Gmail earlier this month, and now anybody can use it. Uh, it was available only to G Suite customers, and as a G Suite customer, you pay $99 a year and you get all these features. So um, that Google account requirement you know, requirement's a tough one. So now you just can click a link and join a meeting, And but like Google, you have to be logged into Google. Um, <laughs> But that's so meetings can be better controlled by their hosts and hopefully eliminate the possibility of Zoom bombing. Uh, Google also has other safety measures. People uh, who are not explicitly added to a meeting via calendar invite have to be entered into a green room when they uh, try to join a meeting. They only get let in when the host approves them. The free version doesn't offer landline dial-in numbers for meetings. Um, now, Zoom updated its security and added transcription, and Google is seemingly hoping that there's still a huge opening for everybody like you who distrusts Zoom. So as usual, anything Google does is a bit confusing. So um, there's also a new tier for G Suite that's called G Suite Essentials that um, includes Meet and Google Drive, but not Gmail for some odd reason. Um, all current G Suite customers still have free access to Meet. And uh, lastly, <laughs> Meet's going to be integrated into Gmail, both the G Suite version and the regular consumer address in the same way that um, Microsoft has leveraged its office dominance to drive people into Teams. Um, you know, it's a good thing and a bad thing because they made it so complicated, but Google Meet is pretty terrific. Can you, so does this free version allow you to like record directly to YouTube like we used to be able to do with Google Hangouts? No. Okay. <laughs> that, that answers that. Um, yeah. it, is, it is interesting that I did that. I haven't gotten an email from Google announcing that I could use Google Meet. Um, you'd think that it's actually in your that. Gmail in the left column. Right, but I I didn't notice. I mean, I read the articles. I knew that I when it, when it, the news first came out, I saw the headlines and everything. But I don't see it in my in inbox. So no, it's not they in need, your inbox. It's in the left column. Well, maybe right. it depends. But they're on assuming the I need. They're assuming I know where to look. They need to. Uh, they need to tell me about it. Oh, I noticed it right away because it was a different thing in my Gmail. But that you know, I guess that just me. Okay. Um, yeah, it is just you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty observant. Yeah, you are. <laughs> um, this uh, this is an interesting article from uh, Vice's uh, Soraya Soraya I think is how you pronounce it Roberts um, about the influencer con economy and and how coronavirus the coronavirus has decimated it basically. Um, I'm going to quote a little bit from it. Um, a woman with unwashed hair and a makeup free face smiles awkwardly iced coffee in hand for a living room selfie she has 142,000 followers another woman poses in a bikini eating pizza a houseplant standing in the in for a palm tree she has 232,000 followers both women are slightly better looking slightly more stylish with slightly nicer things than the rest of us, but otherwise they aren't that different. This is what influencing looks like in a pandemic. Um, 
and then it goes on as brands to, uh, as brands drop sponsors shed payments uh, for links and uh, suspended product delivery it's virtually impossible to predict what will become of the influencers just as it's impossible to become uh, predict what will become of any of us uh, in the meantime so much wealth sucked out of the market so much luxury sucked out of our lives even with most privileged influencers in the world have slipped closer if only slightly uh, to what they once were people just like the rest of us um, <laughs> It's an interesting article because it does it, it, it does it, it doesn't say uh, the bubbles burst on the influencer economy, which kind of it has, of uh, course. But not necessarily entirely. Because the argument the argument of the article is that that you're getting a more real look at, at these people's lives, which you know you which should I have probably been about. probably should have been getting all along, but. Yeah. Look at, uh, traveler, traveler influencers have no work. There's no nobody's traveling. Um, music influencers. There's no concerts. I guess you could work on you know these virtual concerts and everything, but uh, but there's no festivals or anything. Foodies can't go to restaurants. Um, so unless they know how to cook, <laughs> well, a lot of people are doing that. They're cooking in in uh, Instagram and and uh, you know that's happening a lot, but. Uh, you know, this is a time that everybody's having a hard time, so I'm kind of not surprised. Well, it's kind of a good thing too, because that was there was a lot of scamming going on, I think, in the influencer uh, industry, quote unquote. Um, and we should say that there's a world of difference between the influencers, capital I, where there's beautiful people in beautiful places doing beautiful things that you can possibly ever have that experience. Um, so completely aspirational and unrealistic. And then there's influencers who are thought leaders. They're B two B influencers. They're you know they're people who PR people like us have been reaching out to all the time, many years before the quote unquote influencers came along. And that still works. Yeah, well, of course that still works because that's, that's an honest thing. Yeah. So um, speaking of honesty, uh, this is hilarious. Um, this is the Zoom call that you'd be taking part in if there was no filter whatsoever. It's from an Ad Age Creativity article by Alexandra Jardine, who always writes really fun things. Um, the Honest Zoom meeting is by Don't Panic. It's a three-way discussion between a totally unlikable boss and two employees in what seems like an agency. Um, it was written, acted, and shot on Zoom. And the honcho starts out by acting, has anything happened in your sad little lives? And then it's downhill from there um, with confessions about harrowing porn and personal insults and swearing kids interrupting and employees WhatsApping bitchy comments on the side and, and someone pretending their screen's frozen in order to hide the fact that they're talking garbage. And um, viewers may or may not wince in recognition of this, but... Uh, <laughs> The team um, and the team comes up with a stupid brand initiative about coronavirus, and it's uncomfortably close to the truth. It's really quite hilarious. <laughs> well, this one is pretty good too. This is a, an entertaining piece as well. Um, I found this from IO9's Julie Muncy, who posted uh, and wrote about um, a a short film um, about an unemployed special effect. So these, <laughs> everybody's unemployed these days. The misery loves company, right? But it's so bad that even special effects are out of work. We'll just put, it, put embed that in the show notes so people can watch it. It's it's pretty funny. This is also a show. Um, this is Frankenstein Live, National Theater Company's production of Frankenstein. Um, it's a it's an a interpretation of Frankenstein. It has Benedict Cumberbatch as Victor Frankenstein and Johnny Lee Miller as the creature. It's available for one week this week on YouTube. And um, this the source of this is uh, Time In, which is Time In during the pandemic. Norm normally, it's called Time Out, but um, the National Theater's production. Uh, it, what's so cool about it is that also for the next seven days, there's a cast swapped production with both actors in opposite roles. So you can compare and contrast. It's very fun. Yeah, wow. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, this is uh, this is more evidence that voice uh, is, is our future. This is from Chuck Martin at Media Post who writes that, um, that about a Juniper study. Um, of that consumers will interact with voice assistants on 8.4 billion devices by 2024, they predict. Uh, that would be a growth of 113%. 
um, compared to 4.2 billion uh, that are expected by the end of this year. The fastest growth is going to occur in connected TV-based voice assistants with 49% uh, of connected TV voice assistants are expected to be in use in 2024. So uh, interesting data there. Um, I still don't have one. <laughs> I don't have any more good news to you. You do. You have Siri. You have one. You just don't want to admit it. <laughs> no, yeah. I connected TV, I meant. Uh, um, okay. Okay. So are uh, we in the bad news? We are. Go ahead. So this just annoyed me. Um, this is from an ad age story by George Slef, I think it's Slefo. Um, publicist uh, is now offering the PACT, which offers clients 100% refund uh, should they fail to deliver on specific business outcomes. The long-term implication, the article said, uh, could result in a bit of reviewing in how the ad industry works, uh, according to Jay Patasol, who's an, an, an agency analyst at Forrester. So the PACT applies only to small and medium businesses, which um, publicist CEO Arthur Sadoon describes as companies earning between 10 million and 1 billion in revenue. Excuse me, when did those get to be small and medium businesses on my planet? That is not what we are. So um, clients using the program tell publicists what they're key performance indicators are, and uh, like a specific increase in sales, a particular coupon redemption rate, or a new customer acquisition target. Um, but clients have to spend, and this doesn't make sense to me, this is not a lot of money, considering what we're talking about. The clients have to spend $75,000 in advertising over the course of three months, and the results are committed to being delivered at the end of the campaign with um, some measurements in between. So given that agencies only get a small percentage of the ad spend, how does that make sense? So according to Fundera, the 2016 number of non-employer firms making 1 million to 2.4 million in revenue increased uh, from 35,000 to 36,000, which is a very small increase, but there's something wrong with those statistics. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, here's something scary to think. So uh, I am often accused of uh, deliberately scaring the shit out of people. Uh, because Boo. I talk, <laughs> because I talk about all the I I talk about all the the technology that's coming down the pike and how it's going to change things and everything, um, because that fascinates me. But you know, sometimes it's true. I do deliberately try and scare the shit out of people. This probably is a case in point. Um, this is from a protocol article by Lauren Hepler, which is a fascinating uh, full read. It's an interview with cyber war expert P. W. Singer, and I'm just going to quote a couple of passages because uh, it's something we need to really grapple with. Um, the singer says the roles and applications that would have previously seen a more gradual transition over the course of years have been pushed forward in a matter of weeks as a result of coronavirus. Um, an entire generation of kids has been thrown rapidly thrown into distance learning. Remote work is happening on a scale that has had not even ever been expected. Uh, medicine is being conducted remotely in a manner and level not anticipated in a decade. AI and robotics have been put into roles that range from outbreak and, poli and policing surveillance to replacing human cleaning crews to using bots for grocery delivery. After the outbreak is over, I wouldn't say just say it's unlikely. I would say it's unthinkable that 100% of these roles and modes simply go back to the way they were before. What this means is all the related questions, social questions, security questions, legal and ethical questions that we have uh, seen debated over the course of those years are going with us. Many concerns were understandable, understandably set aside during the during crisis. The introduction, the uh, in introduction happened in an emergency, but you've got to figure out, okay, how do we deal with this? And he goes on to say, there's a concept called burn-in, and burn-in is when you take a technology to the bro breaking point. Engineers do this deliberately to figure out how well the technology works. So they'll do burn-in of a new stereo, play it as loud as possible to see how long it takes before it breaks. What we've done is a burn-in for America. So that's scary. 
necessity being the mother of invention and all of that, you know, and, and, it, and we're not going back to how it used to be. So many things are changing now and whether we like it or not, and many of them are things that are not very likable. But, uh, you know, what, what's happened, I mean, the, the implications of all of this, you know, uh, are kids going to go back to college or they're going to take a year off next year because is virtual learning really worth paying all that money for? You know, how can, I mean, there, there are just so many things that have changed to such a huge degree and they're not going back. Well, but, I mean, during times of, you know, during times of uh, rapid technological um Rev innovation and revolution, there are con there are always disruptions in society that are huge. I mean, think about, so look at all the office space that's going to be, that's not really needed anymore. Yeah, exactly. I mean, New York is full of towers of, that are, that are, you know, going to be empty. And what do you do with them? And what do you do with the people who own those? And what do you, I mean, you know, it's just, there's a well, lot of things we haven't thought about. We're in a mess. There's no two ways about it. And yesterday I was talking to a friend who said, ah, I'm not worried about this virus. The media is over-reporting it. It's really not a big deal. I'm like, okay, well, on your planet, that's that's fine. Um, <laughs> so uh, speaking of things that never change, um, this is so funny because it came from his ex-wife. Alex Jones says he'll eat his neighbors if the pandemic continues. <laughs> if the lockdown continues and the, this resurfaced in a segment from his radio show uh, and he explained in graphic detail how he would kill and cook the family next door if the coronavirus lockdown continues um, and so his ex-wife shared this i will eat my neighbors <laughs> i won't have to for a few years because i got food and stuff but i'm literally looking at my neighbors now going i'm ready to hang them and gut them and skin them and chop them up holy camoly that's his wife talking? His ex-wife uh, put that out on Twitter, that he said that. She found oh, the okay. Clip I thought she radio. was saying that. No, no, no. She found the clip from a radio show of his and, and put it out on Twitter. Yeah, he'll resort to cannibalism if the lockdown doesn't end. I'm glad I don't live near him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's I'm my done. bad news. I'm <laughs> done. Bad news too. Um, I have uh, that brings us to shiny objects. Yes, yeah. this is really kind of interesting. I noticed this a couple weeks ago. The New Yorker uh, now has in their recommendations for things to do each week. They have dance and and art and theater and movies. Well, not theater anymore, but except that that which is streaming. But now they have podcast recommendations, and they're really interesting, meaty ones, and they're listed in each issue, usually just one or two, but um, I, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's really quite fascinating that they're doing that. Uh, and they had one from NPR this week. They had one from the Kitchen Sisters, who've apparently been podcasting. Uh, well, they did a radio show. Now they're podcasting for, you know, like 20 years. And um, every time they do it and I go and I listen to what they are um, listing, they're fascinating. That's cool. I think more people should recommend podcasts. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, mine is uh, it's so VidIQ is a tool that we've talked about in the past, and I use uh, use uh, routinely. It's a uh, it's a browser plugin for uh, YouTube videos, so uh, it helps you do a lot of things on YouTube. One of the things it does this is a new a feature that I hadn't been aware of, or it's a new feature, but. Um, it allows you to save replies to common questions on your videos or comments that people have on your video that you run through, run that you have over and over again. Um, so you can create reply templates basically, and and choose them rather than having to type it out every time somebody comments on your on your video. And it personalizes it, so it takes the name of the commenter, the the uh, username of the commenter, and inserts it into the uh, into the template as well. And it's free. Is it? Because we have a free version. I didn't know it did that. Is that brand new? I it's I just came. I don't know if it's a new feature or not, but I just came across it, and um, and we'll definitely use it. Well, this is a geeky one 
for you, Dave. Um, this is Bubble, which is a no-code web app. Um, it's how to, it's, they have a how to build series. And um, right now it has 20 plus in-depth guides on how you can build custom versions of apps like Facebook, Twitter, Airbnb, and LinkedIn, Tinder, Amazon using point and click visual web editor. Um, it, the, the post focus in particular on uh, steps in the data creation that lead to the flow, um, but you don't have to know how to code to, to do it. It's, it's really very interesting. Well, that's not geeky at all. No, well, <laughs> it is to me. <laughs> It's just it point is. and click. Yeah, well, for this non-geeky person, it's it's very geeky. <laughs> um, I am done with my uh, cool stuff. I think uh, takes us to. I get a pro tip. Go ahead. Um, so uh, we we talked several episodes ago on the uh, new feature for uh, LinkedIn that you can upload documents now. Um, in addition to, um, so you can upload a, a, a document, can up to a presentation, a video, um, and uh, and it had been rolling out. I finally got it and have been playing around with I it. I don't have it yet. And uh, I uh, I saved a link to a SlideShare presentation that I I uploaded, and I love SlideShare, but SlideShare is owned by LinkedIn, uh, so you'd think the integration would be tight. Um, but I shared a link to to it, and um, and the thumbnail that it grabbed was completely blurry. It was like co overly compressed and looked like crap. So my pro tip is upload your presentations, upload your PDF of your presentation directly to to LinkedIn, and then uh, don't don't share a SlideShare link. Upload it directly, and it'll actually have a high quality uh, thumbnail that'll pull. So it's a bug in their system, but it's an annoying one. They have more than a few, actually. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so that brings us to the end of uh, episode 306, no? Mm, well, we have uh, some numbers to close it out with. Oh, go um, ahead. This is from uh, Click Z's Barry Levine, uh, who talks about a, a, a Conviva report. I want to say coronavirus now for everything yeah. that kind of looks like it. Conviva report that uh, shows, not surprisingly, a big boost in daytime streaming now. Um, it's up 26% in the U.S. and 20% globally. Um, the daytime viewing if, reflects the stay-at-home behavior, especially the 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. window, which has increased 39% between March 9 and 23. Uh, the early morning hours are up, also up 26%. Pre-prime time rose 20%. And the only drop was negligible, two percent down was in prime time. But the, we'll share the, share the chart in the show notes so you can send you can uh, see when you should not be doing your live streaming show because <laughs> there's too much network congestion. That's so funny. I mean, I, you know, I know all this stuff is available. I read about it every day. I don't seem to find the time to to do all of this, to look at all this stuff, to listen to it. And uh, I cannot tell you where some of the days go, but there's a funny clock. I think I might have sent it to you where instead of one, two, three numbers, it has Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You know, <laughs> what, <laughs> what time is it? Monday. Because uh -huh. <laughs> you know? that's how it feels a lot of days. And, you know, the time it's hard to figure out how, how fast the time goes, even though the months are endless, absolutely endless. But anyhow, that does bring us to the um, the end of episode 306 of the Beyond Social Media Show. And you find us, you just search Beyond Social Media Show. You'll find we're everywhere. Um, there's links to everything we spoke about today at beyondsocialmediashow.com slash 306. I'm here with David Erickson. He's on Twitter as D Erickson, on Instagram as D E Erickson. He's on YouTube as E Strategy, and he blogs at e strategyblog.com. Sometime you have to tell me why there's a hyphen in one and not the other. Um, I bought the non hyphen version when we started doing the show because you never included the hyphen version. 
<laughs> I originally had the hyphen version because I have e dash strategy. That was my first domain that I bought for my business. And uh, and then I bought e dash strategy blog.com so they would be the same. They yeah. both have a dash in it. And then you never used the hyphen. So I thought, fuck it, I'll just buy the uh, uh, um, non hyphen version and, and use that that's as funny. well. So okay. That's why. Well. There you go. Uh, I'm BL Ackman. I'm on Twitter as What's Next. I blog at What's Next Blog. I'm on YouTube as What's Next Blog. I have a website at blockman.com and my Instagram is not very interesting, but Lucy the Rescue Puppy has a fun Instagram. Beyond Social Media Show is beyondsocialmediashow.com and on Twitter we are at BS Media Show. We're on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, everywhere you get your podcasts. We're there and we'll be back next week. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. <laughs>